Good morning and uh, welcome to Seafood from Scotland, second series of the Fish uh, Mongers Masterclass. My name is Roy Brett from Ondine Restaurant and I would like to introduce you to my good chum, great chef and uh, great lecturer, CJ Jackson. CJ, how are you this morning? I'm good, thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear, yeah. Excellent. Oh, Roy, it's so good to see you and I'm so excited uh, about doing this uh, sessions again. It's fantastic to be invited by Seafood Scotland to be showcasing some of the fabulous fish that's coming out of the water around that 12,000 kilometre coast. So and how are you this morning? How, how, how's, how's life down in, down in England? Well, I'm in Kent, so I'm right on the south coast. I'm only about 60 miles from Hastings. Uh, it's good. Uh, I didn't go to the market this morning, up to Billingsgate. I went yesterday to collect the lovely fish I'm working with today. Uh, and um, yeah, it's good. Um, I'm really, uh, really pleased to be doing this, but I can't believe that this time last year we were thinking, oh, we've three months and then we'll be all out and singing. And here we are a year later. So let's really hope that uh, everything goes to plan and we can crack on and open and, and be inviting customers back in through the doors. So what are you up to today, CJ? What are you, what are you going to do for us? Right, well, we discussed uh, the flatfish. We did a little bit on flatfish before. Um, I'm just going to just do something to my screen. Um, two seconds, I just want to uh, be able to see myself, I see my hands properly. Um, and I, um, what we decided we would do today is, here we are, sorry, just two seconds, um, is we decided we'd look at flatfish and we thought we'd look at the fabulous, expensive, um, lovely turbot uh, and I don't I love turbot I see it all the time on the market but it is expensive and therefore I haven't been uh, or haven't used it and certainly not in the seafood school but I have been using it a little bit over the last few weeks uh, I did a Sunday brunch session on channel four recently um, and I chose to use this fish uh, seafish is love seafood campaign uh, which is for the consumer a uh, really encouraging the consumer to buy this I think the only way they're going to buy it is chefs engage with it and use it a bit more, but it is expensive, uh, but it's so versatile. Uh, so we're talking at two ends of the scale. First part of the scale is something expensive. We'd look at halibut. They had that beautiful halibut um, on the introductory. Uh, they had, I think it was gear halibut. It was a farmed halibut they were showcasing. And the person who was sort of folding the fins back with such awe looking at a beautiful fish um, but we thought we'd look at wild today. So we got this lovely um, turbot. And then the other end of the scale, so thinking about um, what's, you know, what's available and what's, uh, you know, what's a good, good buy, I've got a megrim here. Uh, this megrim is about a third of the price of this. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't be using it necessarily with the same dishes, but it's good to see both options. Uh, Roy, do you work with either of these in the, in the restaurant with you? Yeah, I do. I, I work with both, actually. You know, it's um, I, usually we're working with turbot, but there is there is points in the season when the the rows are so big in the soles that we we flip yeah. over from the lemon sole to the megrum. I know there's not the best eating underneath the the, the underneath part of the the megrum. It's less less meaty, but you know, it's, it's me yeah, absolutely. Really fresh and it's really good value for money. But the you know, turbot is such a great fish, isn't it? I mean, it's it, what it is. Uh Absolutely. And um, I used it recently and everybody was slightly shocked about this. I put it in fish pie. Um, but actually, uh, it's because it's costly, um, little strips of it in fish pie with smoked haddock and scallops. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and a real, somebody called it very posh. It's very, very posh. It's expensive. But it's such a, a, it's a versatile fish. Um, interestingly, I picked up this old book, Housewives Diary from uh, 1938. Uh, and in it is a turbot a la creme. So, you know, they've used it in a day to day. So, you know, sort of in the 1930s, they would be using this in a much more ready fashion than we do now. We just look at it and think posh, premium restaurant, uh, but it is um, fabulous. And the thing I love about it is that it's so firm that you can actually stir fry with it like you can monkfish, whereas everything else would just break up if you try doing that. So anyway, I've got one other fish to show. Uh, and there's a reason for this. I've got this one here. This is the witch, or, or sometimes known as Torbay Soul. They started calling Megrim, they've renamed Megrim, um, and they've started talking about it as a Cornish soul. But actually, I can tell you, this came from Peterhead, landed into Freiburg, came into Peterhead. So 
it's a good Scottish Scottish fish. Now, and one of the things I just thought was very interesting, uh, and I do a lot of work now with um, environmental health officers, <clears throat> excuse me, and one of the ways to identify them is that the megrim and the turbot are both what we call sinistral fish or left-handed fish. And people who are studying to become environmental health officers have to be able to identify all these fish. And if I hold up the megrim and the witch, unless you work with them a lot, they actually can be quite confused, I think, uh, in which is which is which, sorry, excuse the pun. Um, with a megrim, it's got a particularly, uh, I'm gonna just turn my hand so you can see, a particularly big jaw um, with a very, very large um, a sort of opening there. And if you look at it from head on, from where you're looking, you can see the eyes are to the left side of the body and the gutting on the underside is to the right. If you then look at the witch, this is known as a dextral or right-handed fish and the eyes are to the right and the gutting's to the left. So uh, that's one of the ways I'd identify these, but particularly the megarine with that big open jaw. Um, it's got a much smaller mouth on a witch, but if you look at the color and you see them in a box, they can easily be uh, confused, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, the witch tends to be a little bit less expensive than megrim, but only by about a pound a kilo, unlike this turbot, which was uh, quite a costly affair uh, this week. So um, I was going to look at how you might prepare them. Um, and I don't know what you might do in your restaurant situation. Uh, I've got to look at the, the uh, megrim first. Would you fillet it? Would you serve it whole if it was small enough? What would you do? Yeah, do you know what? I'm really, really enjoying cooking whole fish just now, CG. Yeah, um, and I think I think customers are enjoying it more. And you know, there was a period of time in the industry that, in, well, in the restaurant industry, that you know people didn't like seeing the head on the fish. Um, yeah, I think it's becoming more acceptable now. Oh, um, good. Okay. Well, in yeah. here, where I've got my finger at the moment, you've got that lovely paddy bit of flesh or the pearl, uh, which when you uh, take the head off. You know, if you go to the, the to Europe now, go to, to Mediterranean, they always cook the fish with the head on, and then uh, they peel back and take that really succulent little piece of meat out behind the head. Although um, it is also very good for stock making. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, what I thought I would look at doing is how I might prepare these. I'm going to start off with that megrim, um, and I'm going to just put my turbot to one side. Um, it's quite a reasonable size. I've got a much bigger one behind me. Um, this is a typical size for a, for a megrim, but actually, interestingly, uh, where my fingers are now, you can see there's quite a paddy bit of row forming. Uh, in a turbot, there's virtually nothing yet, so turbot at this time of the year is looking really good. Megrim um, is beginning to form the row. Now, um, it, I'm always saying to people, particularly with things like plate and that lovely orange spotty fish, that this time of the year, plate isn't a very good option because it is uh, it's full of row, and everything that fish eats goes into creating the roe. Um, and when it creates that roe, it then becomes, becomes quite skinny. If I say to the merchants, have you got any place? I go, well, it's a bit on the skinny side. You know that it's going through the stage of um, producing roe. It's very skinny when it's shot the roe. Uh, it only ta it takes you know, three to four or five weeks to recover and start filling out again. So a lot of flat fish is not great um, in the spring months. Um, place, I'm, I'm not using at the moment just purely because you've got so much row in there and there's some in here. But interestingly, um, I did some work uh, in, uh, over in uh, Ukraine and, the, uh, and in, in Ukraine, they absolutely loved the row uh, and they were, they were drying place and flatfish row and, and like they would bataga and grating mm -hmm. it over pasta. They, you know, they'll do anything. You know, the bataga's traditionally gray mullet row, which is dried and then grated into pasta. And they were doing exactly the same with any row that comes out of this fish. So there is, there is good use for it. Um, although uh, they can't stop fishing it, they catch it and it's gonna have to row. We just have to deal with it. Anyway, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually skin it. And I know you've done this before. And what I'm gonna do first of all, is I'm gonna use a really good filleting knife here. And I just gotta, I'll talk about um, what equipment I'm using shortly, but I'm gonna cut the head off this fish to begin with. Um, I'm just gonna mark round as close so that you get maximum yield and minimum waste there. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is use scissors just to cut that off. Uh, a, a fishmonger would probably use the heel of the knife to cut through the bone. Um, I don't have enough in these, these days, I'm getting too old now. I don't have enough power 
in my hands to force that knife um, through the bone. So heads off, just for me, although you're saying that you'd leave the head on. If you want the head on, um, I take the gills out. You can see what quality fish we have here. Beautiful pink gills. Um, and the blood in there looks nice and red. It looks almost like my blood. So um, I'm just going to take that off. I'd use that for stock, but I would get rid of um, those, um, those gills. If I was cooking it whole, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if I was cooking it whole, the next thing I would do is actually remove the bloodline. Um, and if I open up in through the fish here to where the um, sort of just at the top of the fish, there's that little pocket of blood. And that bloodline is the kidney function of the fish. Uh, and the kidney function is bitter, obviously. Uh, so I would generally tend to remove that. Um, if I was going to cook this whole, the next thing I would do is just trim off the fins. Always trimming fins from tail to head. I'm always saying this. Um, I then see people very cat handily trying to do it this way, but actually the fins flush close to the body. It's very difficult to do it. Turn on the other side, just going to cut those level as well. I'll cut the dorsal fin, sorry, ignore that. I'm going to cut the caudal fin, which is the tail, um, off in one moment. And here you can see where that row is, but that's fine. We're just going to look at the preparation. So what I want to do is actually skin this fish. And to do that, I'm going to use the tip of my knife just to open up, get it just, imagine the skin's a little bit like a, a plaster. I'm going to get my tip of my knife just under the skin in the thickest part of the fillet, I go in about two, two or three millimetres and then just cut down. And what I want to do is use my thumb. I'm going to have to use a, a cloth here. I use your J cloth, but I'm going to use one of my tea towels today. Holding onto that skin, you can see this fish is quite soft. Um, it's uh, out of this in the meg rim, uh, the witch, I should say. I do find them to be a little bit on the soft side. So what I'm doing is holding onto the skin. It's difficult to do this without a cloth. And I'm running my thumb or my finger down the edge. And I know you know, you know about doing this. Uh, skin, things like Dover sole or slip sole are very often skinned in the same way, but very often with a Dover, you'd start at the tail and skin up to the top. So I'm going to hold onto that skin. It's difficult doing it without using a cloth of some description. These, I have fishy cloths that I use and I love that noise. It's sort of that whole thing. It's like ripping off a plaster, peeling <laughs> that back right the way down to the tail over the body um, and just right the way here, nearly there, down towards the tail and then peel it off over the top. That lovely, that's such a lovely, satisfying noise and it rips like so. And then pull that all the way down to the tail. And suddenly you've made it very approachable for a customer because they've not got to peel, peel those off. I'm now going to actually trim the tail off following the natural line of the bone there. Um, and then I'd cook it like that. Uh, people often say, well, why don't I just cook it with the skin on? And of course you can, but then someone's got to remove it. Um, and I think I might have done this last time we, uh, we were on, um, Roy, but I'm actually going to do a Corby air pocket using the whole length of my blade yep. and running yeah. along what would have originally been the lateral line of this fish. All flat fish start out um, as round fish, tiny, tiny little round fish, and then they either move to the left or move to the right, and that's where you're getting, um, oh, hold on, sorry, sorry, I'm just looking at the email, so I think uh, Emily will deal with that. Um, and uh, so if you're a left fish, uh, like your, uh, your turbot, which is closely related to brill, and your megrim, you roll over, so your eyes migrate to the left-hand side, so you become sinistral. Uh, if you are a place, or a witch, or a dover sole, or a lemon sole, or a halibut, you roll the other way, and you become dextral or dexterous. It's, it goes back to the time when, if you were left-handed, you were regarded as being a bit sinister, I think. Um, so dexterous and sinister. So it's not particularly important, but it helps with ID. Um, and then what I'm gonna do, uh, Roy, is my Corbier pocket running the whole length of my blade down um, over the, uh, the, along the, um, the lateral line of the fish and then the tip of the knife in is just using long sweep. And when we're teaching at the school, we sometimes show people how to lift the fillets off in this way. So there's two ways of filleting this fish. You've got your um, 
your quarter cross fillets where you take one, two, three, four, or you've got how a fishmonger does it by taking off the whole sheet in one go. Um, and I think um, it depends on portioning, uh, portioning size. So running my knife along there over the top and pulling it across the body using that whole length of the blade. Um, and I like this, this is a very, very generous portion, but can you see here a large quantity of row? Yeah. So I'm gonna open that up a little bit further, just running my knife over that, and then we'll pull that row out. This is a female fish, I can just tell by the texture of the row, it's got eggs in there. Um, there's also some on the underside. I only pull it out when I really, really need to, but that's what you can dry and use uh, as a fake Bataga. Uh, if, you, if you can't see it here, I dry that, um, mm. salt it, and then in a very, very low oven or a dehydrator. So there's my, um, my meg rim. Okay, what would you do with that? How would you cook it? Can Roy hear me? Say that again. How would you cook that? What would you do with your meg rim? Meg rim, I normally just um, scale the meg rim. Um, I'd, I'd take out the gills and then I would score it with the skin on. Yeah. I would, I would just um, char grill it, just just nice and natural. Um, or I would work with it in the... I don't normally fill it, Megram, so... Okay, and I think that um, because that was actually a really nice sized fish, um, I would normally use... Um, I probably would have filleted that, but you're right, I think on the whole, like Dover and like Witch, it's much better cooked on the bone. Okay, so I know we've talked about doing the turbot. Um, ways of identifying this, these lovely large uh, little barbs on the, um, on the skin. Uh, you can identify this as a wild caught fish by the texture of the barbs. Um, if you have farmed, because they do farm this extensively now, uh, the coloration of the fish tends not to be um, a sort of natural looking. And I think because this is a demersal fish and swimming on the seabed, it uh, camouflages itself by picking up, you know, sort of, it, and they camouflage themselves literally in a blink uh, and the whole color of the skin um, will change. Um, and if this was farmed, it might be a bit paler than this. It's partly to do with the feed and partly to do with uh, the, uh, the amount of light they're getting because they generally swim on the seabed. I must say, I don't know, have you worked much with farmed turbot? Well, you know, it was, it was just about, just before lock, French samples, uh, French farm turbot. What I found CJ, was, it must've been in the feed that they were having. There was, when, when you actually put the turbot into the pan on the tranche, the amount of oil that came out of the fish was incredible. It yeah. was, you know, it's like a salmon that's been overfed on vegetable oil and not enough fish feed. So um, we decided, we, we just didn't use it, but and I was kind of lucky when I lived in Cornwall, you know, that one of Rick's favorite dishes was um, the old turbot hollandaise on the tranche, you know, so from, <laughs> I don't know how many we sold, we used to sell about 50, 60 a night. You, but, you, you can't beat it, can you? It's making me think that I've got this to eat today, so I might well be making myself hollandaise and having that later. <laughs> but uh, the, I must say that out of um, out of the farm fish, I think that um, I, I think the wild turbot is far far superior. Actually, I wouldn't say that with sea bass, but certainly uh, with this, I would. Anyway, the other way of IDing the quality uh, and uh, the fact that this is a wild fish is the belly on the underside. Um, there's a natural slime on here, which wants to be free, free running. Smells very, very fresh. There's no um, strong aroma coming from that. You can see where the fish has been landed. Uh, in order to drain it, to, you know, get rid of the blood, what they do is nick the tail here. They tend to do this with um, some halibut as well. Uh, and then you can just jet water through. Otherwise, when you open it up, you're going to get a line of blood, um, which is going to affect the middle of the fish. So uh, jetted down like that is going to be good. Um, there's a minimum amount of row forming, so that would make this a really good seasonal option. And if I open up the gills there, absolutely beautiful, lovely pink red gills, um, really, uh, really gorgeous. Um, so what I'm going to do with this is look at various ways of preparation. Uh, you could fillet it, no problem about that, and then you could skin it. Skinning this can be quite tricky because you need to push it hard on the board in order to get your knife over, the, um, over these little bits of barb there. But what I'm going to do is pick the, uh, the fish up and I'm going to just mark around by the head, close to the head, so you're not wasting anything. 
And then what I'm going to do, just a little bit further in, I want to just cut round, you can see it's quite a leathery skin, round to just open up where the fish has actually been gutted, like so. Now, um, I'm going to struggle to get any knife through that. So what I'm going to do today is I've got a good staking knife to get my knife through that very dense bone. And can I say that the fish I have here today, I'd ordered a two kilo fish, and this is 1.9, which is only just big enough for me, I think, to, to actually uh, cut it into those tranches or stakes. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to cut this and actually leave it on the bone. Um, but what I want to do is get the tip of my staking knife, a really decent staking knife here, put that uh, blade on the bone. Don't put the body of the knife, the knife in there, the tip on the bone. And then I'm using one of my mallets. My husband always gets very nervous when I start waving this about. It's a polypropylene mallet. Um, and I'm just going to give it one whack. Just to cut through the bone. Another one in there. Just uh, not, hopefully not, you can break using, if you hit it hard enough, you, <coughs> excuse me, you can break the, uh, the bone or break the, the knife. And I'm just gonna cut that through there. Now there are bits and pieces I'd use on this. Um, I'd still, the little bit of flap here, uh, that I would use, we do lots of sliders um, and, you know, little, um, uh, little burgers with this. And uh, I would just skin it. Uh, and just pop that into the food processor. So there's no waste of there at all. There's a little bit on the underside. Um, and I've gone as close to the head as I possibly can. That, if you feel the weight of it, is at least 400 grams. So you realize when you're buying a fish, just how much waste you're gonna get from this uh, once you've actually um, filleted it. Another good reason for cooking it on the bone. There's your bloodline again. So tip of my knife in there, just to open up the bloodline. If I was cooking it whole, I, I'm not going to today, but I do want to get rid of that so that I've got a fish that I can um, cut into steaks. I'm just going to give that a quick rinse under the tap. Um, you can do your song and dance routine now, Roy, whilst I just rinse this fish. Well, you know, we always find with the head of the turbot, you, uh, with all the guys in the kitchen when we're, we're working with it, because we don't normally sell the, the turbot heads, but they're very popular with the team. So they always like to take them and roast them off. Roast so, them, lovely. So All much. that meat in there. Oh, it's absolutely delicious. And um, you know, I was just wondering, do you ever you, do roast the, roast the heads off? Um, with some fish, yes, yes, we do. Um, there's, there's quite a big market for it at Billingsgate, actually. And we get a lot of things like salmon heads, uh, very popular with the um, with the Oriental market, and the you know people like use it for fish head curries. But the head, you get so much meat off that. I think we've got a little bit of educating the, the general public to do because there's still this obsession with eyes and bones. But if you're telling me that people are getting a little bit braver, I'm very encouraged to hear that. Well, there's a few people asking, um, you know, when Peter Head, I'll tell you who it is, Anna Keenan's been asking, is there any plans for a guided tour at Peterhead Fish Market when things get back together in sunny Aberdeen? Well, I think um, I spoke to Jess Sparks, who is the Seafish uh, employee. He works for Seafish. He has the great knowledge um, on what's happening up there. Uh, the market's currently closed. Um, they're only like Billingsgate is open, but it is open to the public. Peterhead isn't. But I think watch this space. Um, I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a wholesale market. Uh, and I think uh, so Jess, who is I know on the call today, might be able to give you an idea about that, but certainly not at the moment. And it might be uh, in the new market that it's not going to happen. Um, I had a fabulous trip uh, around to have a look at the market just to see what was going on, but that was for, for press um, and uh, that was about 18 months ago. Um, but I don't know what Jess, Jess will probably be able to respond to that um, on, um, on, on a text, I suspect. Right, can I just show you something? This is up to here. This is the lid of my turbetiere, which is an old fashioned fish kettle, um, which would be used for poaching. It's a huge weight of fish kettle and it's that shape. Um, and it's the old way of actually cooking turbot. So what they would do is cook it whole. And everybody keeps telling me how fish are getting in smaller in size. But looking at that, that fish is only gonna be the right, it's just 
just the right size to fit into that Tobetier. Um, and although when I've been up to Peterhead, I've seen some huge fish up there, you know, the size of a dustbin lid, they're so large. Um, and I, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we've still got a lot of good stock of those these out there. So I'm glad that we are looking um, at promoting them. So have you ever poached one, Roy? Yeah, I have. Yeah. And what did you do it in a, on, in a roasting tin or a brat pan? How did you do it? Yeah, I, I poached it in a, in a roasting tin and quite indulgent with champagne and fish stock. So um, how lovely. Just a, uh, it was cute. Um, I got it from Welsh fishmongers and it was just one of these punctual moments during lockdown when you just thought, well, might as well. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to hear that because I just think that, you know, when you're locked away, um, instead of eating, uh, when there's a great tendency to eat junk food, uh, but actually you don't need junk food, you can eat anything like this. So, uh, okay, so Jess Fox, only industry on market at present, no visitors to the time being, I'm afraid. So it might be that will change in the future, but not at the moment, which, uh, but you can always, if you want to have a long trip down to London, when you're allowed, that is, uh, there might, there's always an opportunity to have a look at the market, Billingsgate. Right, okay, so what I'm gonna do with this is just look at how I'm gonna portion this. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm using my, um, I might actually need my staking knife actually, that's just the skin's quite, quite tough. So I'm actually gonna mark across the top so it's level, with where um, the, uh, the flap has been removed. I'm gonna mark it first, just through the skin to hit the bone. And this little section here, I would fill it. And then what I'm gonna do is work my way down the length of the fish. Again, it's very tough skin, just cutting through there. Um, and as you're working down, it's really worth wiping your knife just in case there's any blood on that. You don't want any blood smearing across the fish. You can see that skin is really, really tough today. Um, and then I'm gonna do a little, a section further down, bearing in mind when we cut these, you're going to end up with, uh, and I'm gonna just tip that so you can see it. You're gonna end up with a, uh, a section, uh, a darn like that. Um, and then here, I'm gonna do one more to there. And then what I would need to do, I'm gonna turn around a bit to mark through to the other side. This little tail bit, you'd end up filleting using for goujon. That would be the part that I could put in my fish pie. Uh, is that absolute travesty to you, Roy? Fish not pie? Not at all, it's because if you're utilizing the whole fish and you know, the, the end of the day, it's like when you get sides of cod or hake, halibut, when it comes to the tail piece, it's quite a, you know, for a, for a customer in the restaurant, it's quite a disappointing part you know it's like you really want the thicker meatier sort of middle section so um as long as you're using it you know so yeah that, i think yeah. everything I, we've got a lot of fishmongers at billingsgate who absolutely love working with us and they feel that there's lots of options so the next thing i'm going to do um, is i'm going to actually just cut through now i have to use the tip of my knife again i'm going to use my mallet in order to cut through that bone this is when i end up ruining my um like so and then see what i can go a little bit further i might need to use scissors to cut through here to take those off again fishmonger will probably never use scissors but i don't have the power in my wrist anymore i'm getting too old i think so uh, from here and then i'd fill it this little section at the top here so you're, you're getting your you can get your goujons out of that um, and then here just make sure i've cut through I'm actually quite astounded just how hard that bone is today. It's a beautiful looking fish, don't you? It's so firm. Uh, and then cut through again. Yeah, scissors again to cut through those fins. I'm gonna to have to trim the fins off, but we'll look at how we'd end up with a, a darn. This is only just big enough. I'm, part of me regrets asking for a two kilo. I should have asked for two to three kilo. Um, but it's expensive this week. Um, I think partly because it is the best, uh, the best flatfish around. Um, as far as Rose concerned, we'll see some of that in a moment. So cutting that through. And there you can see your lovely section. And what I'm gonna do now is halve those. Um, again, it's a little bit mean. Uh, when you serve this on your menu, what size or what quantity would you use, Roy? 
It's probably about uh, 400 grams. Would you? Yeah. Right, okay. So yeah. in actual fact, what you probably would do is serve, is cook the whole thing, so the whole piece across. Yeah, no, I would I would have done it slightly different than you, CJ. I would have went down the middle um, from the tail up and then I would have crunched it, took off the frills and then sectioned it from there. So what I'm going to do now is I'd normally cut that in half. So you would have split it down the middle straight away, would you? Yeah. That's very often what I do with um, uh, with a with a halibut, actually, is where I often do it like that. You can see here, there's a bit of blood. That's why they had to make that cut to force the blood out. Uh, a lot of fishmongers use a syringe just to push off so we don't get, end up getting that blood there. But I'm gonna cut that off and then just trim. I think with this, because it's not the thickest fish, if, I'd been, if it had been two to three kilos, um, we would've got a little bit more meat on there, but there's no point not cooking it on the bone, I don't think. You know, you've got that lovely bit of bone on there. So just trimming those off. So we end up with some very nice steaks there. I remember, Stay there. Uh, Sorry. I remember uh, down at the seafood restaurant in Padstow, we, we had um, Heston Blumenthal came with his family. We used to come every year for uh, uh, the summertime and he had the turbot hollandaise and he had it with ketchup. What? Did he? Yeah. And I was just like, well, if he can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just an amazing plate with, you know, a, a, a very um, fine fish sauce with fine herbs, hollandaise, turbot, and ketchup, and chips. Well, uh, yes. So I think uh, anything like that. The recipe I'm looking at here, which is from May uh, 1936, it's called Turbot à la Creme. And you steam the cut the turbot, and then you make it, you thicken the sauce with Bermanier, uh, and then a liaison, a little bit like egg, and then put mashed potato with it. And that is just in a, a Mrs. Smith's, uh, you know, cookery book, basically. Right, so there we are, number one. So I would be, uh, so what would you, would you cook that with skin on? How would you do that one? Yeah, I'd cook it skin on, yeah, definitely. That would be an individual portion, I think, looking at the thickness of it. Uh, and what size, when you're working, uh, when you're in a restaurant, what size would you normally buy, Roy? Well, we'd probably look at five to six kilo whole turbots. So, uh, so size, the size of this board. Well, to be yeah, to be honest, see, I, I try not to specify too much on one the size of fish because if the fish is a fish that's caught, you know, and I think sometimes we put too much demand on the the fishmonger, you know, because yeah. like that, that's their catch, you know, when I mean, you become too specific. Um, I mean, sometimes you win some, you lose some. You know, if it's a if it's a lobster, for instance, and so many people ask for four to five hundred gram lobsters because they're thinking of their food costs and their margins. But you know, if it's six or seven hundred grams and that's what they've got, then yeah, so be it. Just use it. Do you know, that's a really really good point. Of course, I run a budget at the seafood school, and and uh, I would certainly use this. And I might demonstrate on it. Um, but uh, you know the, the expense this week was it was costly actually. Um, I don't uh, know uh, what you would normally be paying, but I've it's the, the price over the last year at Billingsgate has ranged anything from fourteen up to about twenty eight pounds a kilo. Uh, this wasn't twenty eight pounds a kilo, but it was certainly um, a, you know a, a cost. Um, and uh, so you know looking at that, so what how, one portion I've got probably cut this one in half again. I've got two more portions. I suppose I've got about portions for about five or six people from this fish. So, you know, when you look at your markup and your costings, that's going to be um, a little bit, a little bit more. But it's such a lovely fish. And I, as I said, I'd love to look at stir frying that. DJ, I've got quite a few, uh, a few uh, questions coming in. Okay, um, far away. One was the, the Heston one that I mentioned. I suppose they're right, absolutely. Sauce your own with, if you're adding tomato sauce, of, I'd imagine it would give it like a, a little bit classic social on flavour. Um, there's one, uh, Kate McFarlane's got a 1.2 kilo turbot and it's getting delivered today. And uh, what cut would you recommend for a 1.9 kilo plus darn or trunch? Up to you. Right, well, I, me, I'm like this. I like that to done. I like cooking on the bone because you're gonna maintain the flavor. Uh, and uh, but you've got your customers who are not going to like that. So what do you think? What would you do? I would I would serve it on the bone for sure, 100%. Yeah. Uh, 
How much was that fish? Somebody's asking. It's Dave Lloyd is asking, can you share how much this fish costs, please? Right, this particular one today was thirty-six pounds. Thirty-six pounds. So it's just it was just it was just it was eighteen sixty a kilo this week. But how that's much? that's wholesale price, and that's a bidding's gate. So that's wholesale thirty-six, and you've got five portions. Uh, well, we'll have more than that. We've got a bit up for the tail. One, yeah. two, three, possibly, possibly five. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good, actually. It's, yeah. It's kind of, yeah. Uh, I'm just cross cutting the, the tail fillet here. So, what I've done is I've just gone down the middle of the finish and opened it up. You're going to end up with this tiny little trim, and that's going to be for my fish pie later. Mm. So taking that off across, so that's your cross cut fillet, which I know we were talking about and how you might do that. That skin, these knives are sharp, but that skin's really tough today. So, um, and there, I, what I would do is skinning that is gonna be challenging anyway. So I'm just gonna take the, uh, I'm gonna cut that in half and just right on the edge of my board, look at skinning it. But skinning this is tough because you've got those little sharp barbs on the skin. So what I'm going to do is literally, using the midsection of my filleting knife, hold on to that, and then keeping the knife as flat as I can. But as, as soon as I do that, I can feel the knife bumping over those little bits of barb on the skin. But those, perfect in a stir fry, tiny little portion from there, but I would be very happy just to cut that up and stir fry it. Do you do much in the way of stir frying? I don't this? Have no. I don't, um, I don't, I don't do any stir fry in the restaurant. Uh, I, okay, baked, roasted, grilled, char grilled. Yeah, I, I just think that this, um, it's just how you approach fish. I, I think with the, the people that work in the sort of, you know, that influence your, your career and your mind and your, you know, how you approach fish cookery, I quite like keeping it really simple, you know, and just really clean. I just... I find that gets the best results, but you know, stir fry is fantastic in the right hands, absolutely. Just not mine. Okay, that's fair enough. So grilling, baking, and of course, we all know that this is the ultimate fast food. So, um, you know, we as chefs, they absolutely know that. The consumer is only gonna learn how to cook fish by eating out and enjoying it in a restaurant, I think, because uh, uh, they all over, with uh, just everybody I come across just overcooks it. Right, this little, uh, this section here, that actually is 350 grams. Um, so I probably, that in your eyes, you probably would serve, just cook that as it is. So would you roast that? 100%. <laughs> okay, uh, what I might do, so what you did, is you were talking about cutting it through the middle, I'm actually just gonna split this in half. Uh, and then, you cook that, so you, you've just gone straight through that bit of bone. So, so you cook those two. Um, Rosemary Williams, she likes fish mouli. That's her favourite. Um, sorry, what was that? She likes which? Uh, mouli. To do, I like fish mouli. Is that M-O-L-E? E, yeah, two E's. Oh, mole, okay. Right, so that's, just get rid of the, the bloodline from that. Um, and that's pretty much, uh, that's ready to cook. So we've got stuff for stock, we've got trimmings for sliders. Um, there's a tiny bit of row in there, but you know, it's a really good option at the moment to realize that this isn't fully in row. It will be a little bit later on in the year. So stuff for stock, stuff for roasting, stuff for grilling. Any other questions, any other thoughts about what you might do with that? I'm not, I'm not seeing any coming through at the moment. There's no, there's no more questions. Okay, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, as I've got it here, let me have a look at the, the witch, which is the other one, I know we did this the other day, this is a reasonable size fish, um, and I'm just wondering about actually filleting it, but you can see here, huge amounts of roe, uh, and that's what I would take out, so there is my, I've got a dehydrator, so I'm going to just um, trim this, just purely, um, in fact I'm trimming it, I don't know why I'm trimming it, because I'm not going to go up filleting it, so for a, uh, a cross-cut fillet then. Sorry, see you. I've got a question for you because you were asking for questions. Yeah. Um, Jamie Mack is asked, if farmed right and fed right, do you think farm fish is a worthwhile source? 
Um, there's there's a good good parts and po bad parts about that. I think if we're concerned about the sustainability issues, and therefore I'm particularly thinking about halibut, farm halibut is such a fantastic option because you know these big fish take a long time to grow, um, and I think we're being you know we're being asked to hold back on buying them, not buying them forever, but using them, and therefore though that beautiful uh, farm halibut that we saw on the, on the front, um, I must say that uh, I. Uh, I do this test at the seafood school where I have lots of chefs and fishmongers coming in um, and I get a, a we do a, a taste of wild versus farmed mm -hmm. turbot mm -hmm. and never really works very well um, halibut um, is better uh, sea bass they can't tell the difference actually to be fair um, certainly if you've got a decent farmed uh, bass which you can take up to two kilos um, it can be a really good option uh, but I think, um, you know, if you've got wild, you've got this fabulous resource and we're looking after the, the, uh, the, the, um, the wild resource of this, this is, can't be a bad thing. I don't know what you feel about it, but, you know, you've, in Scotland, you've got such lovely uh, and, you know, and very carefully harvested fish. Yeah, it's a, quite a controversial point, though, harvesting, farming and, you yeah. know, as it's, it's done properly, you know, and the environment's been looked after, then I think it there's not, you know, as I say, there's not enough fish in the sea, so it can only be help, you know, the, yeah. the demand. I think, um, I think if it's done responsibly, I think it's a, re it's a really good help. And if we're looking at a, a resource that's dipping a little bit, like that uh, wild, looking at the farm, I think it's a really good option. So I was very impressed. I've seen some farming of halibut, and I was very impressed with it. Well, there's um, a okay. Other one. Um, Diane Cummings, she's asked what I charged for a... Uh, uh, a, a turbot portion in the ration, so it'd be about thirty-five pounds, Diane. Um, Epi's asking, Epi, hi, Epi. I've not seen you for ages. Nice to hear from you. Um, what would I? How would I split a whole turbot? Well, basically, Epi, I would cut the frills off around the sides, and then I would split right down the middle bone. The same method. Um, as CJ was using just now with the mallet all the way up, and then I would tranch on down from there. Um, Roy, uh, so Jamie Max asked, what do you think of sous vide and would you do this? Uh, personally, not. I know a lot of people do like working with sous vide, but I just like to cook fish naturally um, without being in the bag. Uh, can you eat fish offal? Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Um, there are some, there's some fish offal I would eat. Uh, I'm thinking actually monkfish. Uh, monkfish liver is such a delicacy uh, in Japan. Uh, it doesn't look very good, but you can use it. Um, with things like this, uh, certainly the roe. Um, and I think I've very often looked at some of the liver that comes out of this fish and it looks really creamy, almost like foie gras actually. Although that's a bit of a, uh, that's a, bit of a, a conversation to be had over that. But uh, I possibly would pan fry it. I think it's going to have a, you know, it's going to have a, a delicately offly flavour. But um, the the liver and certainly the roe are the two that I would go for. Someone was asking about ceviche as well. Um, I would. The one thing about ceviche, there's a lot of discussions about that. But I think in a restaurant environment, you're supposed to freeze your fish if you're going to eat it raw, even if it has gone through that cold cooking process. But I don't think there'd be any reason why if it was cut finely enough. And marinated long enough. Would you do ceviche with that? Is that something you do in in Ondi? I personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it with turbot. Um, it's too tough. A bit too. A bit too needs cooking. Yeah, I mean, we'd, I've used different fish. I've used sole, bream, um, obviously tuna, etc. But uh, usually scallops are the use. And we, lovely. Yeah, really delicate. Really lovely. It's been crazy that you have to freeze them now and then use them. I don't. You know, I know. I know the the science behind it, but. You know, it's, got, it's gone. I know, down. and I think the only one we can get away with is salmon, to be fair, because <clears throat> you're not going to get any parasites, but it is a, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. Right, what I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to cross cut fillet this. So take the whole sheet off, but you are going to get a very, very thin fillet on this side. So I'm just inserting the tip of my filleting knife, got a nice bit of flexibility there, three or four centimeters into the fish, and then just cutting out towards the frill. Uh, and it's using that action. You can see there's a little bit of bruising on the side of the fish here. Tip of the knife in uh, and just threading that over the bones. So my knife's at a slight angle here, so you can actually feel the knife threading over the bone and then cutting out a little bit further. 
And I think, Roy, you said this is the technique that you use uh, in the restaurant. You, your guys actually do this cross-cut filleting, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I was lucky enough to work with a guy from Brixham um, for about three years in Padstow, and uh, that's how he filleted. And he used to be a speed filleter, so he was, uh, <laughs> he was <laughs> paid by the kilo. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Down the frill here is quite fine, so you're not going to get much meat out of that. So I'm going to run my knife uh, along the length of the flesh until I can actually feel the back of the backbone. And then from the top here, just putting, in, uh, putting it up a little bit so you can see it, I'm going to get the tip of my knife over. And then this time um, here, you can see I'm extending the control I have over my knife uh, with my finger. Um, and I'm having to, uh, I don't have very large hands and this is a, a 20 centimeter blade. Uh, and I put my knife on there to be able to extend some of the control I have over that blade. So running it all the way down over the, um, the, um, the ribs of the fish and then cutting away like so. CJ, have you got a few more questions? Sorry? You time for a few more questions? Yeah. So there's a question here. Um, Based on the farming question, have you had a chance to work with Gia Halibut as a farm product? I have. Um, I've been, we get it quite a lot of in the market um, and uh, I sometimes buy it and use it in the school. With some classes I use it and demonstrate on, on the sectioning of it and that's when I split it and cut it. But we're looking at a four to five kilo fish there, unlike my, my wild fish. Perhaps I should have dug a little bit deeper and got a, a slightly larger turbot. But anyway, so yeah, like Gia very much. And also, how long would you brine or salt your roe before dehydrating for a megrum or tagger? Okay, so what I would do with this, um, I would salt it um, probably uh, for an hour or so. And then what I would do is I, I've got a dehydrator and I'd switch it on. I put it into the dehydrator for about eight hours to get it really, really dried out. I sometimes do it with scallop rows as well. You probably use that and dry them and then powder them down and put them in the wisdom into sauces, that sort of thing. Okay, you see the rows here. Um, I will do that, actually. What I might do is, uh, if I dry that today, um, we'll be able to have a look at it next week when we're looking at shellfish, if we've got time, that is. So there's your, you can see here, uh, though, what happens with the fish. So when the fish is breeding, and the rows forming, um, all the effort and everything it eats goes into producing that row and the fish gets thinner and thinner. So at this time of the year, uh, you're missing a whole section of flesh there. Um, come uh, sort of four or five months down the line, that fillet would be right back over to this area. I must say that um, I actually uh, served up Dover sole at home. Um, to, my husband doesn't eat a lot of fish, but I served it up and it was very nice. The following night, I bought Megrim home and served that up. And he said, you know, this is so much nicer than the fish we had last night. I mean, he is, I can, he's not here as I can say it, but he's a man, Mancunian, doesn't like spending a lot of money on things. But, you know, I think there's an element, you know, these fish go a beautiful white color when it's cooked. So um, anyway. DJ, a few questions. Yeah. So um, I've got one here from Eric Preston. He's asking it do, between, Tronchons and arms are not often seen on the menu. Do you think they should be used more? And also, Diane was, oh, no, so that Diane's question has been answered. And Gita is asking, how would you rate brill versus turbot? And is brill as expensive? And what quality does it have as an alternative? Okay, well, that's a very, the brill and turbot question is a really interesting one because actually, brill is one of my favorite fish. Um, at one point, it was considered to be uh, the, the poorer cousin. And at one point, and we're talking 20, 25 years ago, it was a lot less expensive. Now, I would say it's comparative in price, possibly a tiny bit cheaper, perhaps. But you also get slightly smaller fish as well. Um, and I think looking at um, turbot, if you're looking at a smaller turbot, uh, you're not getting such a good return because you're going to get at least 65% of that fish is going to be bone. So you want something that's a reasonable size, so you can get a decent amount of flesh off it. Brill, to my mind, um, has got a slightly, not softer texture, but slightly more open flake. Um, and I, it actually is one of my favourite fish. I love John Dory as well, but that's got a bit of a question mark over it at the moment. Uh, but brill, definitely something I'd be looking at eating. Um, so that was, a, that was the second question. What was the first one again, Roy? What did you say? 
you're seeing more tranche on the menu, uh, or, or not? You, you know, with, with the question about tranche, um, not often seen on menus. Do you think they should be more on menus now and serving fish on the bone like that? Um, I, well, I'm very keen on it, and I think that you know, if we've got a, the only way we're going to get people to eat more fish, and it's such a key thing at the moment to be eating, um, you know, seafood that's been landed around our coast. We've got to support the fishermen. Um, and the only way we're actually going to manage to do that for the consumer is to educate them um, in a restaurant situation. So if you're going out, you know, you're a seafood restaurant, so people would specifically come and choose you. Uh, but if you put something on the bone and, and you can actually educate the consumer to start enjoying things like that, it's going to be a good thing. I really do think. And, uh, and the other thing is, if you are taking your fish and cutting it yourself, when I trained as a chef, I did a little bit of work experience at the Connaught Hotel. We're talking about nearly 40 years ago now. But everything came in as a whole fish. Everything was cut, stocks were made and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, the more we address the preparation on site, I know you guys, you've got your guys and, and Roy, you're a dab hand at this yourself. But I think, uh, you know, the more that we handle it, you know, and serve it like that, the better. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's my feeling. I do agree with that. Um, I've got an interesting question that I, I can't answer. I don't know if anybody in the panel can. Um, can I, I'm just going to do a quarter cross fillet on the underside of my uh, my um, white uh, witch, by the way. So I'm just cutting cool. down there to take off a, a single fillet. Anyway, carry on. So Jamie Mack has got another question. He heard that the gear um, halibut isn't smoked on the premises is it sent off to get smoked and does it come back packaged is that right that's a question i, I couldn't answer uh, jimmy i don't no, know I, if can't, I can't answer that either i'd have a word with them um it's such a i was looking at um a company that sells uh smoked halibut yes and i was this is somebody that does it um but i don't know whether that that's what they do yeah i really don't know so uh, you were saying earlier, Roy, about the, the underside of the fillet being a little bit thinner than the dark side. Um, it is always a little bit on the thinner side. Okay, any more questions have we got? Um, Epi loves this, really hope we can start uh, changing more views to match this too. So, you know, just the, the way the, the cooking techniques, the cutting. So that's, yeah. that, that's a nice one from Epi. Hi, Epi. Um, any other questions uh, to Jamie? We're going to find out for you um, about about the um, smoking. We're not sure. So uh, we can find out. Yeah, if anybody's I'm yeah. hopefully booked on to next week, we can do some more. I think so I'm, this is a female row. This is female row. I'm going to sort that and we're going to dry it next week and have a look at it. It won't stay nice and pink. It'll go much darker. Uh, my fish frame, there's a bit of blood in there, but I would use that for making a stock. Um, we've got various bits and pieces. And there we've got a quarter, two quarter cross fillets there and there, and we've got the cross cut fillet at the back. So different ways. And I think certainly for budgeting, um, I think this, that double fillet would be good for one person. I'm not so sure that this, the two underside, well, probably for us, for my family, it might be right, but. Okay, any other questions have we got? Yes, uh, Stephen Curry's asked a question. Would you recommend to cross fillet rather than fillet from the spine? I think it depends for me on what type of dish you're going to be cooking. Um, I probably would you agree with that, CJ? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, there's some fish I wouldn't bother um, filleting, things like a Dover sole, because you know you're paying a lot of money. That Dover sole can be extraordinarily expensive, and you get tiny little fillets off it. So it's much better to. And then you've got all the little bit of frill around the bone, which the, the customer can then eat. Um, the crosscut fillet here, which is your whole fillet, and then your quarter cross fillets, which is how I, it's very often, you know, when I was training as a chef, that's how we learn how to do it. It's only when you're working in the fish industry that you start looking at these, uh, these whole um, crosscuts. I think a crosscut, it depends on your budgeting, it depends on exactly on the dish um, and the size of the fillet. So that, uh, you probably could pan fry that, but it's quite a large fillet. So... I think it depends on, on what you're going to do, but it's really useful learning how to cross cut fillets of fish. I think it's, uh, it's chefs, uh, fishmongers would never do it the other way. They want to take a whole fillet. It's quick. It's easy. You, your blockman who speed, speed cut straight in, straight down over the bone takes them probably 10 seconds to get that fillet off. Took me two minutes, but you know, I'm, I'm talking at the same time. So, okay. Any, any other questions have we got? 
Yeah, you've got one here from Elizabeth uh, Atia. Hope I've pronounced that right, Elizabeth. Uh, what local fish roll could we make fake portaga from? I'd like to experiment. And Jamie's asking, I have done, I haven't done ceviche before. Why is it you have to freeze it? Oh, okay, but the first, the first one then uh, for Pataga is classically made with grey mullet roe. It comes, it's a classic Italian dish. You pay up to 95, 100 pounds uh, per kilo because obviously you're losing a lot of weight during the drying process, but it is a delicacy. Um, and, uh, but I, when I, as I said, when I was in Kiev in the Ukraine, they dry absolutely everything. Um, and I had this look, look, look a bit like look a dried pig's ear, uh, but it was a piece of a place that they a place row that they dried and grated over. It just gives you very very subtle flavour, not necessarily the sweetness you might get from grey mullet, but I think you can dry, pretty much dry anything. Um, and then the other question about freezing, um, the uh, Food Standards Agency have concerns about parasites in fish. And to be fair, uh, in a certain times of the year, you're going to get fish worm and that sort of thing. Um, the only fish that's not going to be affected by that is actually salmon, farm salmon that is. So farm salmon doesn't tend to have pick up parasites, but they're just being very cautious and therefore anything that is going to be um, going to be served raw, whether it's cold smoked, whether it's a viche, although that's gone through a, a process of pre-cooking, you know, a cold cooking process, um, even curing mackerel, you're supposed to be doing that. And I worked with a uh, a sushi restaurant a few years ago and they um, I got the most beautiful fish off the market they wouldn't touch it none of them would eat it because they're so used to filming it so and okay I've got one else? yeah I've got one from Brian is um I like this one are puppy are puppyettes of fish considered too old school these days are puppyettes yeah I can consider what too school food the old school Old school. Well, do you know? I was going to just do just that. Let's have a little look. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, I am old school and therefore I quite like the whole idea of that. Let me skin this fish bit and we'll look at a popiette. So your popiette, using the midsection of the blade, I'm just going to skin this. I know we've only got about one minute left. We're nearly off, but skinning it. And then, of course, uh, the skin side goes on the inside to so the whole thing. And a popiette, the great thing about the popiette, you can put all the frill in the middle. And then I used to roll it like that. Would you, you probably wouldn't do that anymore, but if you gave, if you gave that as a, to, well, it looks tiny, you need two of them. What would you do? You're laughing, Roy, probably for you, it's just too no, much fiddle. I, re I remember doing that at the Savoy Grill, doing like Poppyettes of Soul and I am Soul Bon Fam, Soul Very yeah, Neat, yeah. all the classics. And uh, I love it, I absolutely love it. Well, do you know, the thing with that is it, you put your fork in it and there's absolutely nothing that you're going to, you know, either you put a farce in there or you put another fish, a little bit of salmon, strips of salmon, smoked salmon, whatever would be lovely in there. So, you know, I think with the gelatelic cooking is great. You know, we're just beginning to really appreciate the versatility of this fish. Um, OK, so did, yes, did this back in the old days of the uh, waterside. Yeah. OK, any other questions? I think you've got another one. How would you cook and serve halibut or turbot frills in the cheeks? And is there any more? Do you know what I would do is I would just pan fry them. I love frill. In fact, very often um, the, uh, the, sh the fishmongers I work with, they like the frill for them is the best part. So frill would be good, pan fried, cheeks poached or pan fried lovely and of course in your halibut you do get two lovely pieces of meaty cheeks out of each side uh, so you know pity to, to waste that absolutely I don't see if we've got any more questions um, no, Roy, it's been so good chatting to you you know we have we have hardly ever had this opportunity um, and um, I'd really um, I'd really really appreciate you being invited to do this again on behalf of Seafood Scotland um, I'm a great uh, supporter of anything Scottish. My family all live up there, as I'm always going on about. Um, and um, I, every time I, I, I do these, I keep wanting to move north. Uh, but I hope everyone's keeping well. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing this. And we're meeting up again next week and having a look at shellfish. Is that, that's right, isn't it? That's right. Honestly, CJ, thanks so much. I mean, you know, like every time I watch you doing a, de a demonstration and you start to break down the fish and you've got the specifics and the, the cuts at... I love it. I absolutely love it. And I'm not just saying that. I just think it's really refreshing. And one thing that they talk about old school, new school, uh, fish skills, they, they just don't go out of fashion. So uh, 
Well done. That was brilliant. Well, no, and I love chatting to you as well um, with your fantastic background and your, you know, all your experience. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it is our responsibility as chefs to be getting uh, the consumer to be eating more fish and therefore putting more on the menu. So you don't have to do the really expensive. There's lots of opportunities with your megrim and your witch, poach it, pan fry it, all sorts of things. So lots of options. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So everybody, thank you so much for attending. Calm me down, you help me to sleep Your head on my shoulder, brings a shot of your heat Oh, this love is big enough for me